Hi everyone, welcome to the Beam Summit. This session by John is going to cover how to write I.O. for Beams. John is a software engineer at Google, primarily focusing on Kafka I.O. and I.O. in general. But without any further ado, please a round of applause for John. Um, today I'm going to be telling, talking through how to write a Beam I.O. Um, but first, uh, going into a little more of who I am, I'm the team lead for I.O.s at Google. So if you've got any, of, any questions about the I.O.s that um, my team supports, which is primarily Kafka I.O. and the, all of the I.O.s that connect to Google products. Those are the ones we focus on, those are the ones we know best. So feel free to ask me any questions about those after the talk, and I'll either be able to help you or find someone who can. Uh, for those who are at Google, I am the other John at. Uh, I am not the VP of benefits, so if you see an email about the 401k, that's not me. Uh, he gets assigned a lot of data flow bugs. Uh, as mentioned, I work mostly on Kafka I.O., and outside of that, uh, I hike, I run, and I play a lot of Warhammer 40K, and I'm very excited about the new edition that's releasing right now. So to start off, um, I'm going to give a brief definition of what an I.O. actually is to me. And reading from slides is mostly bad, but this matters kind of a lot to, to how you actually write an I.O., which is that an I.O is any transform where the primary purpose of that transform is either writing data to some external sync or reading data from some external source. So the code you see on screen, don't copy it down, it's garbage, um, is an I.O. It's very bad for all sorts of reasons, but it, def it meets that standard for pulling data from an external source into a Beam pipeline. So it uh, grabs a file that you pass in, it scans it, and it emits the rows in that file as elements in a P collection. This is an I.O., and if you were just doing some very um, slapdash prototyping, it might work for your purpose, but it's never going to scale. You know, it reaches to file system, so it's not going to work in a, in a remote setting. It's bad for all a number of reasons that I could go on and on about, but it meets that definition, and that's really important to understanding that this talk is actually about how to write a good I.O., not just something that gets the work done. Mostly because something that is good is bad will frequently fail to get the work done. So we're going to go through challenges in big data I.O. in general. Um, most of the challenges in writing a Beam I.O. are not especially unique to Beam. There are uh, aspects of doing data input and output in any, at any large scale. I'm going to talk through the primary technical um, feature we have in Beam for actually implementing reading data, which is the splittable do fun, um, which has some key functionality that makes it uh, very useful for actually consuming data. I'm going to talk briefly about watermarks, um, because they are easy to miss when you're writing an I.O., but they're very important for the functioning of the remainder of a Beam pipeline. I'll talk briefly through writing data, how it's in some ways simpler than, write, creating a, than reading data, but if you mess up, the consequences are much likely to be more severe. Um, I'm then going to you know, go through some of what uh, a good I.O. is beyond technical implementation. So there's a lot to making an I.O. usable for any of the people using Beam that is not strictly contained to any uh, technical details to making an I.O. function. And I'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, that. So why is writing an I.O. hard? Um, probably step one is parallelizing reads from a single data source. When you've got you know, terabytes of data in a BigQuery uh, environment, you know, you can't really process all of that data f by just consuming it on a single machine. You have to somehow split that data up in a meaningful way such that you're able to con uh, consume it over many machines, both for performance and cost reasons. Um, the tricks there are very frequently making sure you actually process every data element, that you're not just leaving stuff behind, but also that you're not reprocessing data that you don't, don't need to, making sure that every element is actually processed at least once, but not much more than once, I guess is how I put it. Um, when you're operating at scale, exceptions are inevitable. 
um, both the scale type of exceptions that you would see at a, in smaller scale work, um, you know, your data schema doesn't match the schema of the database you're trying to write to, but also stuff that uh, doesn't tend to come up in kind of the prototyping stage. Um, for example, running out of quota on, on the 29th of a month, right? You, what do you do when that happens, right? That's not, these are the kind of scenarios you need to think through when you're dealing with big data I.O. And the challenge of unbounded reads. So uh, I'm going to be using Kafka as my primary example today. It's the source I know best, it, and it uh, has a lot of the, um, it contains a lot of the things that makes it tricky to um, read from. So for example, let's say you are reading from a Kafka partition, you've read up to offset 50, uh, and your machine fails for whatever reason. You want to be able to resume from offset 50, offset 51, without having to reprocess those initial elements. They might not be available anymore in the streaming context, and even if they were, reprocessing that data is not very efficient. In addition, in unbounded contexts, sparse data from a time perspective can come up as a challenge that you need to consider. Um, consider a to Kafka topic that only, notify that only has uh, events uh, talking about schema updates, right? Those might be an important thing to pay attention to, but they're unlikely to be happening every minute. And the unfortunate news is that although we have lots of challenges, there's no easy one-size-fits-all solution. Um, we've got a number of good patterns in our existing IOs for how to handle different um, common storage patterns, right? You know, many things are databases or like databases that you can use these existing patterns to help read from. But because every source and sync is a bit different, and because they're especially they're, the libraries we tend to use to interact with them are different, um, every I.O. does require its own dedicated, thoughtful design. There is no easy answer. There's no abstract class you can extend and just have an I.O. readily available. So splittable dupens. This is the core piece of technology we use to actually make a reads work. Um, and the reason they exist is primarily because the baseline Dufin can't be used in an infinite context. And it also doesn't work well if you're trying to pull down a large number of data, a large amount of data. Because in a Dufin, uh, you take one input element and you can output a, a large number of um, elements from that input element. The problem is you can't do an unbounded number, which is what we would need to do to support um, streaming sources. Because that process is a function call, that function call eventually needs to return, and if it returns, it means that input element is going to be done, done being processed. If it were to never return, then that machine would, uh, then the processing of that element would fail the instant anything goes wrong with the machine, which is inevitable on a long enough, long enough scale. So splitable dofuns have the feature over the baseline dofun of actually being able to output an unbounded number of elements from a single input element. And that capability is what allows us to do unbounded reads. In addition, the, uh, addition um, there are a number of other features built into the splitable dofun that uh, enable us to do um, easy parallel reads, make it very straightforward for a, you to consume a P collection that is already parallelized and output a P collection that is um, the, the full fan out of all of your kind of meaningful data records. And they enable us to support an un, uh, dynamic reads in that we can read from a, uh, uh, an increasing number of sources at a given time. Because this is a Dufun, it reads from a P collection. That P collection can be references to uh, a number of sources. And it can, that P collection can, of course, grow in a number of ways. So the example for how this is done in Kafka, this is simplified, but it's a, it's a good outline of what we do. Um, the Kafka SDF read implementation starts with a quick uh, a periodic impulse. And that triggers us to query for new Kafka partitions. So for example, if you want to subscribe to a Kafka topic, that Kafka topic could be rescaled by uh, your a customer at any given time to have to go increase the number of partitions, um, and because we pull for those new partitions, we can continue uh, picking those up, and, and that way, any time they increase their their parallelism, uh, the pipeline can automatically scale up to that parallelism without having to be restarted. That P collection of partitions then goes into the meat of the read, which is this FD SDF. 
So each partition um, has a number of records indexed by offset on Kafka. And essentially, we have this additional component in the splittable Doofin that is the, the core of what makes a splittable Doofin work, which is the restriction tracker, which very, um, there's a bit more technical detail behind it, but it very much keeps track of what you've worked, you've actually done for the input element. So in this case, the restriction tracker for a uh, Kafka partition uh, essentially I initially would say, you know, whatever start index you are subscribing to Kafka on, let's say index zero, and it would say, and then it would say, you have not read anything from index zero to index infinity, right? You've read nothing from this Kafka topic. And as you go through, essentially you, you, notif you tell the restriction tracker what you've read from the Kafka topic such that if things were ever to halt, it's actually uh, the, the runner knows where to resume from this input element, which is the Kafka partition. The actual implementation is a little bit different than that, but that is a, a good way to think about how this actually works and how it's actually meaningful. Within the SDF itself, we also support the idea of pausing without it being a crash. So based on whatever um, you as the implementer decide is a reasonable cadence or a reasonable technique, you can tell the runner that you have done some chunk of work on this restriction, but there's more work to be done. So for Kafka, this will always be true. You'll be essentially, unless you have only reading a slice of Kafka, you're always gonna be returning this process continuation dot resume to basically tell the runner, hey, I've consumed these 500 records from Kafka, um, but there's more work to be done. But it, it helps notify the runner and enables the runner to, to uh, have exert control over this Doofin that it wouldn't have over a standard Doofin. Um, and if your split ha and if your restriction happens to be complete, the, then the Doofin can tell the runner, I'm done with this piece of work. And this solves the unbounded read from a Doofin problem, and it helps enable us to have this dynamic read, right? This Doofin is taking one element from a P collection and inputting and outputting an unbounded number of elements, but each of that, that, that operation can live in parallel on, on any number of machines as long as each input element is different. So as you scale the number of Kafka partitions, you can scale the number of workers you could use. Um, so that's the splittable Doofin. There's a lot more to it, um, but that is the core of how it works. Um, the one very important thing to consider when you're writing this splittable Doofin though is the watermark of the data. So this is really a question of when is your data? And this is a little bit ancillary to actually pulling the data itself, right? You don't need to think about watermark to be able to pull data from Kafka, but watermark in Beam is computed basically from the all of your upstream watermarks. And if you're reading from an external source, there is nothing meaningful upstream in terms of the, the watermark data, right? The watermark of the impulse event is not super meaningful to actually what the watermark of your, your, your real data is. So you want to manually um, uh, modify it within this with StuFun to have a more meaningful timestamp. Um, this is extremely important to enable windowing to work downstream of your DoFun at all, which is used in a variety of contexts for grouping and aggregating any data. So um, you'll, you do want to consider your watermark here. Um, and when you source your watermark, you want to consider also, um, do you want the watermark to simply be the wall time of when you received a data element? Do you want to extract it from the data itself? To what extent do you want to, your users to configure that? So consider, consider watermarks carefully when, when implementing your Doofin. And this is also a place where you can run into challenges with sparse data. So for example, if your user has a windowing function downstream of your read and you only are getting data once every you know, hour or so, you're only getting one data element every hour or so, the watermark for your Doofun is only going to be changing infrequently. And that can have some uh, unexpected effects when it comes to um, uh, any sort of windowing based logic. So consider that carefully um, when writing these IOs as to what you should do when your pull loop in a Doofun which will, can or will frequently uh, not return any data. So when you actually, so this is, that's kind of the, some of the technical background there, but when you're designing an IO, some of the first questions you really do have to ask then is how can you parallelize your data? So in Kafka, it's pretty straightforward and a number of systems it's reasonably straightforward. It's whatever the existing um, split, uh, 
parallelism of that system is can be your, your first go-to, but you might be able to do more depending on what APIs your source system provides. Kafka's uh, partitions um, in databases, it might be individual tables, it could be subsets of tables, um, depending on what you're doing. Uh, and then the next question is, how can you track your data within that parallel? Um, in order for a Kafka to meaningfully resume, for example, after having consumed those 50 or 500 messages off of Kafka, we need to be able to seek to a specific index on the partition in order to actually start at uh, uh, offset 501 without having to reprocess all of those initial records. So when you're thinking of cr tracking your data in this restriction tracker, it has to be something that you can meaningfully seek to. Otherwise, there's a, you're going to have a lot of challenges when actually implementing this I.O. In, in a performant manner. And for some sources, this is, these are going to be the same thing. For example, in, uh, in the SDF implementation of how we read files right now, uh, we can parallelize reading from a file by chopping a file up into blocks of lines. And then within those blocks, we're still using uh, row offsets to, to keep track of where we're going. So sometimes these can be the same logical differentiator, sometimes not. Um, and then in the, a big question that, that goes to usability of IOs that we're running into a more of a challenge now is what do you expose to your users as options? Um, BigQuery I.O. is uh, particularly known for this as having three different write modes, each with their own sets of configs. It's very, very confusing to someone who's new to BigQuery to know what options to choose. Uh, are these defaults useful? Have they, you know, what, what pairs of options has been well rigorously tested, right? That's not an easy thing to answer. So it's, it can be uh, important to uh, restrict the options to ones that are um, well suited to the big data use case. And when you are providing your users options, make sure you provide a sensible set of defaults that is you know, rigorously um, tested and you know will work for at least the baseline usage, even if it might not scale to all use cases. So writing data is simpler than reading data, uh, straightforwardly. Um, there's no special beam construct. You don't need to use a splittable do fun. And the primary reason for that is by the time you get to a read in a pipeline, the meaningful data has already been parallelized in and is in a P collection, right? You're not usually, write, you're, you're not usually writing from impulse. You're writing from a P collection that's already been split out. Um, ideally, it's already been shuffled at some point to rebalance across workers, but that's not really necessarily your, not necessarily your IO's concern. And it means that you can just use a standard doofin to write to an output. However, writes are where all of the major bugs we've seen in uh, IOs uh, recently have been. Um, sometimes you'll have a feature not work in a read, but writes are where you see data loss. The biggest reason for that is you're interacting with client libraries wherein you're sending data to them, and there's a, a very large number of responses you could get back. Um, and the in ha proper handling of that category of exceptions is easy to do. Um, we've seen it happen a number of times from a variety of experienced developers. Um, and it's uh, hard to recover from because it's the point in time when data is leaving the Beam ecosystem, which means that any built-in safeties a runner has are less available to you, less available to the pipeline to make it easy to recover from. So. Less complex for sure, but you really do need to consider when you're designing uh, an IO write, uh, what kind of exceptions can I receive and what should I do when I get them? So if you've gotten a schema mismatch exception from your BigQuery endpoint, there's not much you can do with that, right? Your data doesn't match the table. There's, not, there's no amount of retrying you can do to make that succeed. Uh, you need to propagate that kind of error very, uh, in an ideally fairly verbose way up to the pipeline such that it gets exposed to the user and it's easy to work for them to, to address. Um, quota, but, but going back to the quota example, you know, if you run out of quota at the 29th of a month, in principle, that request could be retried. So then you have to consider, okay, if I have retriable requests where they're going to fail for something that is in theory temporary, uh, how should I retry them? How frequently should I retry them? Should I retry them on some delay? You know, how, what should my doofin do to handle the situations where I'm getting these exceptions back, but they're in, the data is in theory fine? Um, 
other uh, really valuable features when you're uh, writing a, uh, a write is what information can you pass downstream of your write. So you might initially think that once you've written data out of the pipeline, there's not necessarily anything more to do with it. But uh, very frequently, we users want to use metadata about that write to trigger a variety of, of useful side effects in their pipeline. Um, you know, simply an aggregation of how many files did get written to their file store or uh, other such metadata, especially metadata about errors in their writes, is very, very valuable to pipe downstream of a write. And as a result, pdone is not something you should use anymore. Um, and there's a very slow process to try and consider get, get rid of it where it already exists. Uh, in general, if and you can pipe anything downstream of a write, it's probably valuable to do so to some, to some user somewhere. Um, and the, I'll, I'm not going to talk too much about the implementation, technically how you would do this, but you should also consider how you are able to batch data, writing data down to your sync. Um, no one wants to open a transaction to write one row to a database if they can avoid it. And so you should consider, given that data is processed in bundles in Beam, to what extent is it meaningful to bundle up your data when you're passing your request downstream from a performance perspective? And what are the consequences of a bundle failing, right? When you've when you've um, emitted data downstream and you want and it's partially succeeded, down to down to your sync and it's partially succeeded, and then similar to the right, um, similar to reading, um, write has all the same questions about configuring configuring your IOs. So. You've got a solid technical design together. You understand how you're going to split your data apart. You understand um, what kind of exceptions you could get back when you're writing to this sync. The next steps here are really about making the IO much more usable to whatever your users might be, um, especially in the context of the broad pipeline, uh, the broad beam ecosystem. So we have a number of documents that have been written and discussed about what IOs should look like. Uh, you know. Convention is that in Kafka IO, you have Kafka IO.read and Kafka IO.write. They're both static methods in a single class, in, and this is Java, of course. Um, static methods in a single class to make it easy to, for users to access kind of these top level views. We use um, um, kind of these, these, these patterns that are, that are standard to make it easy for someone to you know, go from a pipeline that is writing to PubSub to a pipeline that is writing to Kafka and not have to fundamentally learn like a new syntax for every IO. Um, we are looking to increasingly support cross-language IOs. You know, writing an IO is a hard thing to do. Um, most people don't want to do it in every language. Uh, but I believe we have this point most, I don't know if you can call into Go transforms from Java and Python, but I know every other direction you can you can call cross language transforms right now, and you should really look to say, okay, what work do I need to do to support a cross language access into my into my transform to make it easy for someone in you know a, the Python ML ecosystem to access your transform to grab data from your from some data source that you initially intended for like a, primarily a Java user, but you want to make that available to them in a way that's easy to write and it looks like a Python pipeline still. We've developed a, uh, a standard of schemas and schema wrappers that is pretty straightforward to use that uh, I'd recommend looking at. Um, tomorrow at 4 and 4.30, um, two members of my team are talking through how they did this wrapping of, a, of IOs for um, JDBC and I am blanking on the other IO that, that recently just got wrapped. So if you want to hear about how they did that, do something, look at them tomorrow. And then um, making sure that uh, our, your, the performance of your IO is well known, right? Our users are usually coming to us for handling large amounts of data. They care how long it's going to take. They care how much it's going to cost. Um, Yi, a member of my team, and Pranav uh, from a neighboring team have put together a much, a very, much more robust performance framework over the last couple of months um, that is almost launched. Um, and they've been integrating that with um, a number of pipelines and IOs to basically get better performance metrics. And we're in the process of building out um, better documentation and better views for like what the actual performance is, metrics you can expect out of these pipelines are. So if you want to learn more about that, there's another talk on Thursday.
any questions.